Wascota is a small town in northeast Michigan that lies along Lake Huron. On Halloween of 1969, the local high school was set to have its homecoming football game. The game briefly had to be evacuated due to a bomb threat. No bomb was found and no one was hurt. Unfortunately, that incident would not prove to be the biggest story of the night. That night, the three youngest daughters in the Hobley family returned home after trick-or-treating with their mother. Their oldest sister, Pamela, had plans to go to the homecoming game at the high school and then meet her boyfriend at a Halloween party. Pamela was not home, and there was no sign that she had been home while her family had been out trick-or-treating. As the night went on, Pamela's mother began to worry. Pamela's boyfriend told them that she had never shown up to meet him at the party. As Pamela's worried mother began to call around to try to locate her 15-year-old daughter, she learned that she was not the only concerned parent in town that night. 16-year-old Patricia Spencer was also missing. Pamela and Patricia attended the same school and were acquaintances, but they were not known to be close friends or to spend time together alone. However, for some reason, they skipped part of school together on the day of Halloween. They were seen walking along River Road together and then seemed to disappear into thin air. The ongoing investigation into the girl's disappearance has been hampered by the fact that it was not taken seriously when it occurred. Authorities dismissed Patty and Pam as runaways and failed to follow up on potential leads. In May of 2013, a man reported to police that he had picked up the two girls along River Road the day they went missing and dropped them off at a gas station near the intersection of River Road and Route 23. This made him the last known person to see them. When asked why he did not report this in 1969, he told the police that he had. The man had come forward and been interviewed by the police on November 1st, the day after the girls went missing. Officers working on the case did not bother to even report the man's existence in the case's file. It is impossible to know how many other leads may have been received but ignored. While both girls had a reputation for partying, they had no reason to leave their home. Despite her young age, Pamela had recently become engaged to her boyfriend, so she had every reason to stay in Escoda. Pamela's sister Mary is adamant that her sister and Patricia were picked up by the wrong person on Halloween of 1969 and met with foul play. She's also adamant that if the police had done their job correctly, both families would know what happened to their missing girls. Mary continues to return to her hometown every few months to hang new flyers bearing her sister's image and asking for information. 30-year-old Sylvia Salinas owned a small grocery store at the intersection of 31st Street and Avenue Q in Galveston, Texas. On October 31st, 1989, a silent alarm in the store triggered a phone call to 911. Police responded within minutes. Upon entering the small store, they saw bloody footprints on the floor. Behind the counter was Sylvia's body. Her killer was already gone. Sylvia had been stabbed in the heart with a large knife. The killer then used the murder weapon to pry open the cash register and steal all the cash out of it. This was what had set off the silent alarm. While the motive for the crime appears to be robbery, authorities believe that Sylvia knew her killer. She had no defensive wounds. She kept a gun and a machete behind the register to protect herself, but made no effort to grab for either of them. Her killer was able to get close enough to stab her without scaring her. According to her family, Sylvia would not let anyone behind the counter unless she knew them well and trusted them. After the murder, approximately 20 different men were interviewed and provided statements and fingerprints to the police. They were all cleared. In 2008, Hurricane Ike destroyed all the stored evidence in Sylvia's case, except for a videotape taken at the scene. Luckily, fingerprints taken at the time of the murder were entered into a database and are available for comparison. In 2018, Galveston police announced plans to resubmit them. For now, Sylvia's case still remains unsolved. Doris and Alan Sorensen lived in Windsor, a small town in northern Colorado. The couple ran a jewelry store on Main Street. Doris, 66, ran the counter of the store while her husband Alan, 79, mainly did repairs and engraving. On November 5, 1984, a friend of the Sorensons called the police out of concern for their safety. Neither of the Sorensons had been seen or heard from since Halloween, and newspapers were piling up at their front door. 
Police Chief John Michaels, the town's main investigator, took the call and agreed to go out to the Sorensen home. He was able to gain entry to the house through the back garage door. At 10.45 a.m., he discovered the bodies of Doris and Alan inside their brick home. The couple's beloved dog had also been killed. Chief Michaels found Doris in an upstairs bedroom, and Alan was found downstairs. They had both been bound and strangled. Authorities determined that Alan and Doris had been killed on Halloween, the day they had last been seen. While the Sorensons were pleasant people, who were kind and welcoming to others, they were also very private people. They interacted with the public only at their store, not attending parties or community functions. They left their house dark every Halloween to let trick-or-treaters know not to come to their house. This unfortunately meant that no one was near their home on the night of Halloween, giving the couple's killer the opportunity to not be detected. A year prior to their deaths, potentially down to the day, Alan and Doris were the victims of a burglary. Either late at night on October 30th, or in the early hours of October 31st, 1983, a hole was cut in the roof of the Sorensen jewelry store. Thieves stole over $27,000 worth of gold and loose jewels. The vast majority of the stolen property was recovered several months later. In February of 1984, seven people were arrested in connection with the crime. Three men were convicted in the burglary. However, they were all in custody at the time of the Sorensen's murders. Police will not confirm if anything was taken from the Sorensen home at the time of the murder, but they have stated that nothing was removed from the jewelry store that night. According to a friend of the Sorensen's, Doris and Alan potentially took cash and loose diamonds home with them at night. This means that robbery could still potentially be a motive in this case, even though it cannot be made known to the public. The case went cold very quickly, despite Chief Michaels working 16-hour days and traveling to different states to follow up on even the flimsiest of leads. Police have investigated persons of interest, but there have never been any real suspects in the case. As of 2018, the case is considered open, but inactive. Roberta Miller, known affectionately as Bobby, lived a life full of family inactivity. She had six siblings and raised two children of her own. She had recently finalized her divorce from her husband, Gary Miller. She had previously worked at her husband's car dealership, but was now working in real estate following her divorce. She had also decided to go back to school and study business. The Guilford, New Hampshire resident loved crafts and hiking on nearby Mount Major. She spent Halloween of 2010 at a hardware store, shopping for supplies to make new flower boxes for her living room windows. The rich life a 54-year-old built was tragically cut short, however, when she was killed inside her home on the evening of October 31st. Bobby's body was discovered by her adult son, Jonathan, the following day. She had been shot multiple times. Bobby's yellow lab, named Sport, had also been killed by several gunshots. Police found no signs of forced entry. Bobby's family rented a billboard on Route 104 in Meredith, New Hampshire, to ask for information and offer a reward in Bobby's case. The billboard is yet to generate an answer to the mystery of Bobby's murder, but in 2018, it did generate controversy. The usual message was briefly covered with a new sign questioning whether or not Bobby's son Jonathan was cooperating fully with the investigation into his mother's death. Jonathan has always maintained that he had nothing to do with his mother's death. He accuses his uncle Ken of putting up the billboard, citing long-standing tension between the two of them. Ken has never confirmed if he was indeed the person who changed the billboard. The tensions within Bobby's family aside, they continue to fight to find out who took her life on Halloween of 2010. In 1983, 28-year-old Nancy Penner lived in Paradise, California, with her boyfriend, Jeff Jeffries, and her two children. Four-year-old Omar was from a previous relationship, and infant Yana was Jeff's daughter. On Halloween night, Nancy was invited to celebrate at a friend's Halloween party. She never made it to the party. October 31st would be the last time anyone had contact with Nancy. When Nancy's brother tried to invite her to Thanksgiving dinner and could not contact her, he began to worry. He filed a missing persons report for her on December 19th. Three days later, when he should have been celebrating Nancy's 29th birthday, Jeff Jeffries left California and flew to Hawaii with Nancy's two children. 
he eventually returned to the mainland United States, leaving Omar in California and dropping Yana off with his stepsister in Iowa. Jeff committed suicide in 1986. Omar was eventually adopted and changed his name to Daniel. In 2010, while acting in the play Masquerade at the Moulin Rouge, Daniel suffered what he described as a meltdown and began attending therapy. Coincidentally, he was in the process of transitioning back to using his birth name at this time. During therapy, Omar began remembering upsetting details from his early life. He remembered hearing Yana crying and seeing Jeff with his hand behind the toilet in the family bathroom. He remembered Jeff shooting and his mother running out of the house clutching her arm. This was the last memory he had of his mother. Police investigating the original missing persons report on Nancy did discover a bullet lodged in the bathroom cabinet of her home, corroborating Omar's recollection. It is unclear if this memory of Omar's is from the night Nancy went missing or sometime previous to it. The most obvious assumption to make is that Jeff chased Nancy from the house and killed her. Jeff reportedly owned property in rural Butte County, leading to speculation that he could have disposed of Nancy's body there. Unless Nancy's remains are found, however, it cannot even be said for sure if she is deceased. Furthermore, Nancy and Jeff grew pot at their home. If Nancy had been shot accidentally in a scuffle, or Jeff had to shoot her in self-defense, Jeff may not have wanted to alert the police. If Nancy did die on Halloween in 1983, it was not necessarily murder. Without Jeff Jeffries, even if Nancy's remains are found, the exact circumstances of her death may never be fully understood. Omar reconnected with his half-sister Yana in the 1990s. He has submitted a DNA sample to the police to hopefully help in Nancy's case. In 2010, he was finally able to locate and contact his birth father, Nancy's high school sweetheart.